Next up, I'm excited to welcome Sri Ram Raghavan. Sri Ram Raghavan is Vice President at IBM Research for AI. In this role, he leads a worldwide team of over 600 research scientists and engineers across all IBM research locations who are advancing the field of AI and accelerating its applications to the digital transformation of enterprises. Prior to his current role, Sri Ram was the director of the IBM Research Lab in India and the CTO for IBM in India, South Asia. Sri Ram began his career in IBM at the Alamadan Research Center in San Jose, California, where he led a variety of research efforts at the intersection of natural language processing, data management, business analytics, and distributed systems. Sri Ram is an alumnus of Stanford University and the Indian Institute of Technology, Chennai, India. He is a recipient of the IBM Corporate Award for his technical accomplishments and a member of the Technical Advisory Board of the Robert Bosch Center for Data Science and AI. Sri Ram is joined by Vijay Karuna Murthy, Head of Engineering at Scale. Vijay, over to you. Welcome, Sri Ram Raghavan of IBM Research. I am very grateful for you taking the time to join us today, and I'm very excited about everything that we can cover in this talk. I know there's a lot of core foundational research you're doing on large language models. There's also new exciting domains that you're exploring. So I'm excited to get into all of that. Um, but just to start, Suram, how did your studies lead you to working in the field of AI and ultimately becoming head of IBM's global AI research division? Hey, Vijay, pleasure to be here. And I'm going to enjoy the conversation, I'm sure. A uh, little bit of my uh, journey, I, I did my undergraduate back in India at, in, at IIT Madras. I, I came to grad school at uh, Stanford University, and when I was there, I, I interned a couple of summers at our research lab, IBM's research lab at Almaden in San Jose. And I, you know, it, was, it was a great experience, and I sort of well, like I began, started, began working for IBM. So, you know, come Valentine's Day on 2004, I was, that was my first day. Uh, at IBM, um, and since then I have been on a, a roller coaster, right? Played a lot of different roles. Um, I actually began my journey in enterprise AI. We're, we're doing a lot of uh, analytics, unstructured data processing, uh, you know, even in grad school. But I think my first real taste of enterprise AI was when I, when I joined IBM. And sort of what struck me then was there's such a wealth of unstructured data still untapped within enterprises. That was still true 2004. To some extent, one could argue that is still true today, and part of the journey of AI is just to you know, be able to get more and more insights. So that's been a part of the journey. Uh, I've been, you know, I've, I went back to India. I, I ran our India Research Lab for a while. Uh, I was the, the CTO for the India and the region. I got a lot of client-facing exposure. And then 2019, I came back, if you will, to home base to sort of core AI research and running our global labs. And I'm, I'm happy to be able to work with and learn from sort of a global... Uh, set of research scientists and engineers across all our labs. Uh, we have, I think, 13 locations, and, and I, I work with all of them. That's great. That's a wide range of work that you've done in this field. So I, I'm excited to deep dive into some of that, and especially the fact that you started with enterprise AI. That, that's an interesting area for us to explore. Um, in past talks, you've stated that AI is at an inflection point and that there have been advancements in the field, especially in deep learning. But businesses themselves still face significant challenges to scale AI, and still expensive and time consuming. From your position, how have you seen the field of AI progress to date for businesses? So maybe, uh, Vijay, I'll, I'll sort of uh, have my answer in sort of in two parts, right? So let's talk about, if you will, business adoption of AI, and then maybe we'll look at the field of AI and why, because we're very excited about the inflection points in AI. So sort of part one, if you look at business, I don't think it's more than a few years back where we were still talking about single digit adoption, people were debating 4%, 6%, what's the penetration of AI? I think we, and maybe COVID was part of it, maybe there was other elements of it, but more and more, I think we're sort of past that curve. So if I just look at one data point earlier this year, uh, we sponsored a study, I think with over 7,000 customers in many countries, just looking at AI adoption, a global index. And we're starting to see, you know, 35, 40% adoption. Of course, it varies in industries, varies in regions, varies in use cases. But definitely, the pattern is clear that AI adoption definitely is accelerating. Those challenges remain, 
But I think it's now about help me address those challenges as opposed to questioning, should I or should I not be doing it? So the, the problems are there. Um, do I have skills challenges? I absolutely do. Uh, do I have challenges of going from uh, things that work into operationalizing it? Those challenges remain. But definitely, I think the, the curve is, is, is definitely in trending in the right direction. And one of the other observations is that a lot of enterprises, I think, are also at a point where it's not about sort of an AI use case off on its side, recognizing that it's AI embedded in your processes, your applications, your workflows. So it's things you're doing, but automation as an example is, is, is a, is a, is a cross-cutting theme whether it's IT automation, business automation, customer service automation, it's a very common theme. And I think the new one that we heard earlier this year is really the role of AI in addressing sustainability. More and more customers are starting to ask. Again, that's a cross-cutting, cross-industry global concern. And I think people are starting to look at what's the role of AI. So I think the arc is in the right direction, but the challenges definitely remain around automation and skills. Now, if I step back and look at the field of AI, there I think it's, um, so one way I like to think of it, uh, to maybe articulate, I think, why we feel there's an inflection point is not get caught up, if you will, in the, the techniques and the algorithms, but look at how have we represented data in AI. And sort of if you look at the history of how we did that, because obviously data is always at the heart. Your AI models work on data, and so data representation is foundational. Very early on, we tried to do AI by writing down knowledge in rules. So it was like symbolic AI, if you will, like from the 50s and the 60s. Clearly, that didn't work beyond experiments. Then we came to the, uh, the domain of machine learning. We said, okay, we're going to learn from the data. But you still had to create the representations by hand. Anybody who did AI at that time knows about spending hours and hours and days and weeks doing feature engineering to get the data just in the right shape that you could apply your machine learning technique, and that still remains the case. Then came the era of foundation, uh, deep learning, where deep learning said, if you have enough data and compute, I can learn the features for you automatically, so I can take that away from you. But it was still not reusable. It was narrow. You had to have enough data for the task, and then you could apply. And yes, there was a little bit of portability, but it was still narrow. Then what we are seeing with foundation model, which is what all of this excitement, at least personally for me and for IBM research, is we see the opportunity to create general purpose data representations that you create once and use for many, many, many models. And if I connect it back to what we said about the business problems, if there's an opportunity to sort of amortize my cost, do the hard work once, create a rich representation, if I can then churn out AI models quickly, I think we can definitely see an inflection point in AI adoption. So that's sort of a landscape of how we see this. I, I want to dive into that because you're, you're getting into some very provocative, interesting statements. So you, you, uh, two pieces of what you were talking about that were really relevant to this question, the data representation piece and these really powerful foundation models that you have. How does IBM see those two pieces coming together for these sort of business problems and really accelerating adoption of AI in the enterprise? So uh, the short answer is uh, we see foundation models as effectively data representations. So yes, we use the term model because you create them with a training procedure. And, and I think the best examples out there that everybody is familiar with is models in natural language processing, right? We've seen models like GPT-3, T5, Lambda, they're big models. And the reason, uh, and I'll connect it back to what we're doing from an enterprise perspective. But I think from our perspective, it's less about the model itself is less about the fact that you're using a training procedure to create a powerful representation of an underlying data space. That underlying data space can be the world of English language, an underlying data space could be programming language code, the underlying data space could be other things. And once you create that representation, then you fine tune to create many different types of tasks. Sometimes you don't need a lot of fine tuning, the model can do the task on its own, but more often than not, to get the right accuracy, you're able to fine tune to do many, many tasks. So to, to us, a foundation model is a powerful way to create a data representation without being limited, as you were in the deep learning world, by either human supervision or labeled data. Because, because you're up taking a self-supervised approach, you're able to take vast amounts of data and create a representation at scale. And that to us is, is, the, is the big thing. And, 
And we've seen this now in NLP, pretty much practically speaking, all state-of-the-art NLP, both academic and commercial, is essentially powered by foundation models. But the more exciting part is it's just not just an NLP innovation. This is transcending every modality and going to bring modalities together. So that's the big inflection point that we're really, really uh, excited about. Yeah, that's a really uh, provocative statement. We're going to delve into it in, in a little bit. I, I maybe I'm, I'm jumping a bit ahead in, in the, the where we're going to explore. But I, I wanted to start off by exploring this world of models and model development that are going on at IBM. You, you have one of the world's best research institutions that you've built under you that 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 basically are, are able to see a year or two or three years ahead into the future. And, and as I understand it, you've created your own language-focused foundation models at IBM to advance your Watson offerings. Um, I'm curious like how model development informs IBM Watson and has advanced your offerings. And how do you see those foundation models innovating across this entire technology stack and providing greater innovation at scale? So let me start with maybe the language example, right? So uh, given our focus is delivering AI to the enterprise, so we've been using foundation model technologies, if you will, within, we have a stack called the Watson NLP stack, which is our primary language stack that's used to power all of our offerings. You know, enterprise offerings, I, today the stack goes into over 20 plus IBM products that use it for, you know, all sorts of language process. From low level language primitives and tokenization to higher order models, detecting entity sentiment, you know, the entire NLP stack. We've been using uh, foundation type models in that now for, two, three years or more. And, and our approach there has been to focus on, given the, the target market that we deliver to, those models are built on curated data, data whose origins that we know and control. Uh, we take a lot of effort around the cleansing and the curation of the data to, before we create the foundation model. And, and just to give you a sense of the benefit, probably took us, say, six years, seven years to support 12 languages. When I say support, support fully, like not just support, support at all capability. With foundation model technology, you have doubled the number of languages in less than a year. So that gives you a sense of how much benefit that we have got. Now that benefit is one step removed because eventually our customers and products just see natural language processing APIs, but the foundation model is what's powering all of those use cases. But what's, like I said, is even more exciting for us is what we see our team starting to do. And sort of the easiest way for me to explain that is, if you squint hard enough, almost any piece of data looks like a language. Now, sometimes you have to squint really hard, but if you squint hard enough, it looks like a language. And what do I mean by that? There's a language, the human language that we communicate in. There's the, when machines or you know, are sensors in a factory, when they emit time series data, there's an underlying language. It's it's, it's not random. There's an underlying language around it. You've got to tease it apart. That language is not made of the words of the English language, but there is a language of the machines. There's a language of code in which we build software. There's a language of chemistry in which, you know, molecules are expressed. And in fact, you can actually write it down. If you've written, you know, high school chemistry, written chemistry things, there is a language associated with it. What we see happening is, and our teams at IBM Research have been building now, taking sort of this idea of what worked really well in NLP, and applying it to a lot of these other modalities. So time series data, uh, code, uh, materials and molecules and chemical data, even tabular data. And we can go and I'll give you some examples of what we do. But that's what's exciting. And what's been true is in each of these use cases or each of these applications, the overall philosophy remains the same. Yes, you need to invent new types of architectures, new types of fine tuning methodologies, Obviously, the metrics and benchmarks might change, but the, the sort of this general notion that in an self-supervised fashion, you take large volumes of beta, build a representation, and then use it for task, is, is working like magic in every one of these modalities. So that's sort of at the heart of, of this exact. And we can cover some use cases in those, those modalities. I picture our audience right now squinting very hard and trying to see this interview and the room around yeah. them in the form of language. Ho hopefully you, you have some great insights from, from doing that. But I, I want to delve into, I, I think it's interesting that even as you talk about the model side, you also mentioned the data side and, and data curation, data cleansing being very important. Um, we're going to hear a lot at this conference about data-centric AI and, and what the future of that term means. I'm curious for IBM research, um, what does data curation mean and how does that apply to the self-supervised 
mode of learning that, that you found really important? So I think in the foundation model world, look, I don't think the act of curation, quality analysis, synthesis, and integration is going to go away. But I think what foundation models let you do is sort of do that once, not once. I'm sure you have to maintain the foundation model. But do it so that you create the foundation model and not have to go through that pain for every AI model that you want to deploy. So in some respects, you are sort of amortizing, if you will, the cost. So, so as an example, I'll just go back to our Watson NLP stack example. There's probably 20 derived models in our stack that all come from the a common foundation model. Did we go through curation, processing, cleansing, careful removal of noisy text? Absolutely. But we didn't have to do it 20 times. 20 teams that built individual models didn't have to do it. We did it once, were able to fine tune. So that's sort of one big benefit. The other benefit is, is also a statement about how much label data that you need. So you don't need labeling for training of the foundation model because that's sort of self-supervised. You therefore need smaller amounts of label data for the individual tasks that you want. And that's a huge deal in enterprises. The challenge we always used to hear was relative to consumer-facing companies, many enterprises for their use cases may not have billions and billions of data points of label data. Foundation models significantly reduce the amount of label data that you need to be able to do a task. So just to give you an example from the time series domain, we've been doing work in applying you know, typical IO, you know, industry 4.0 type use cases, predicting behaviors of uh, you know, natural gas reactors, chemical impurities in a, in a processing plant, or alarms from, you know, from automobiles. And in every one of those scenarios, the amount of label data you have is small. I mean, you actually don't want reactors to blow up every day, or you don't want things to fail every day. So you have small amounts of label data when you want to do anomaly detection. But we were able to use all of the, the I mean, they're all instrumented. There's like years and years of sensor data available for you to build the model. But the amount of label data is small. And we're seeing dramatic improvements. And we're not talking like 10% improvements over state of the art. We're talking 2x, 3x, 50% improvements over your ability to use all of the data to make much better predictions. That's great. For those particular rare classes that you're talking about, you know, an incident, a reactor that, that we all hope is very rare and doesn't happen on, on a daily basis, how does your team go about identifying how to capture that data, how to understand it, how to uh, like know what you're going to see before you actually see that event happening so that you can apply the, these foundation models to, to understanding the, the patterns that you see in time series data? So there's an interesting part there is, with the whole philosophy of the foundation model, you're not creating it necessarily for one use case. So anomaly detection is, is one use case. Uh, production optimization would be another use case. Failure prediction might be a third use case. You are essentially creating a foundation model, very much like the way you create a foundation model in natural language, which is sort of play the trick of blank out a bunch of words, make the model predict the words and learn a foundation model. Now you're doing the equivalent in time series data. Our teams have, our teams have invented techniques to do masking of multivariate time series. Use that to create a foundation model. And what the foundation model learns is if you will, sort of the behavior of whatever is the physical asset, the reactor, the plant, the machine. So that's what the model is learning. So you don't have to necessarily know the use case you have to have a powerful way to represent it. And then on a use case basis, you fine tune. And for that use case, you have to collect the small amounts of data that you need. But there's a big difference between saying, give me 100,000 units of label data versus give me 1,000 pieces of label data. That's a big difference in many, many use cases and accelerates adoption of AI. I think the other, other important element of this is, again, goes back to our skills conversation from your first question. Look, creating foundation models does require deeper expertise, deeper compute, uh, data aggregation, it's leading edge techniques, but it suddenly empowers data science teams in many, many companies to suddenly become more effective because now they are starting with not having to do, learn the best representation every time for every task and do all of the work. You can do that once and data science teams get very productive because now they are starting with the foundation model as the base, not all of the raw data as a base. And that is a statement of increased productivity of those data science teams. 
I would say the most exciting thing, Suram, about the way in which you're talking about foundation models is just the sheer number of use cases that you now are, are discussing that go beyond what we traditionally think of as language. Can you talk to me a little right. bit about the journey? You know, now that you've identified this core potential of foundation models to understand problems that maybe can be rephrased in, as tokens or, or in a language-centric way, how do you go about identifying that chemical structures or reactor sensor data is a fruitful domain for you to explore researching? And, and how do you position researchers to make success in those new domains? So I think this is where now sort of the innovation is, right? The innovation is now inventing architectures and training procedures uh, to all of these different domains. And so, so I, we, we talked about time series domain. That was a new way of training time series foundation models. Um, I'll give you this other example. I said, if you squint hard enough, you can look at a table as a language. So here is sort of the, the rough analogy. Imagine you have a table of you know, transactions. Could be credit card transactions, shopping transactions. You can say that, you know, Vijay's, there is a la language describing, let's say, your purchase behavior. That's captured in a thousand transactions. That language is made up of rows. Think of the rows as sentences, if you will. And then the columns are like the words that make up your sentence, right? So I, I'm giving that as an analogy to say you can now take tabular data and treat it as a language. Obviously, the training procedure, the actual technology we'll use will be inspired by what you do in language. You'll have to make changes. But our teams are now creating tabular transformer models. Now, what can you use them for? You can use them for all of the use cases that you can do AI on tables, you know, prediction, shopping prediction, nest best action, offers, and so on. But you can also use it for something very interesting because these models can do generation. Since they are learning a representation, I can do synthetic data generation. And that's becoming very, 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 very popular now, both as a way to give data science teams new data to work with to train larger models. It's also a way to address the fact that in many industries, it's very hard to make sensitive data available to data science teams. Regulatory concerns, privacy, data residency. So if I can train a foundation model on, on data and provide synthetic data, then data science teams can go off and do their data science, and I can then bring it back to test. So that's a, a powerful construct. So that's a, a different class of use cases that we're starting to see in, in tabular data. And, and then in like the, the world of uh, molecules and chemistry, uh, we have seen We've seen foundation-based models beat benchmarks across the board. These benchmarks used to use other deep learning techniques. You know, these were all graph neural networks. So this wasn't like, we weren't talking about beating benchmarks from 20 years ago. We're talking about foundation models in chemistry beating benchmarks from like three years ago. And again, the potential is huge. Synthesis, property prediction. I mean, given COVID, we all now understand the importance of molecules in chemistry and invention in that space. So that's, uh, that's the third one. And the last one, uh, and this is very, very close to IBM's business and I think to all of us as technologists, applying AI to code. I think that's a foundation models have a huge potential. And one of the things we have been doing there, we have seen a lot of work by others around you know, programming, developer assistant, things like you know, Copilot that helps you, you know, write code. One of the things we have been thinking about on code is, Look, software development is more than just programming. There is deployment, configuration, security. There's an entire development processes that developers go to. There are scripting languages. There's many others that developers work with. So we've been applying foundation models to some of those scenarios to see how can you build auto automations that help smooth multi-cloud deployments. Can you assist developers in those kinds of activities, not just in programming? And so more results to come from that space but it tells you that our philosophy remains the same. In all of these things, the approach of building a foundation model, fine tuning, we're seeing benefits in every one of the modalities that I think we touched upon in the last five minutes or so. Since you bring up credit card transaction data, my transaction data is pretty boring. If you found even a second cup of coffee in the morning, it would probably stick out as an outlier to you. But but when we talk about these domains where privacy is obviously very important to you, you've talked about synthetic data being an avenue you're exploring. There are elements of, of trust and auditability that are now coming into play for foundation models. Can, can you talk us through a little bit about what you mean by trust and, and how does that apply to this domain of research? So that's, I think that's a great question. And maybe again, I'll sort of answer it in two parts. I think, look, I think the area of trustworthy AI continues to remain important with and without foundation models. And so if I step back and 
ask that question, and then I'll come back to how it's influencing our technical agenda and foundation models. Our approach to thinking about trustworthy AI is there are first number of facets to trust. We talk about privacy. We talk about fairness and you know, bias. We talk about explainability. There is sort of the quality. There is robustness. So our approach to trust is, A, there's a set of facets of trust. And almost always, there is, if you will, like a trade-off. Um, this is like a, a space in which you, know, you sort of have to figure out your Pareto for whatever use case you are getting off. There's going to be a trade-off amongst all of these. So that's one. And second is, there is no universal approach to doing any one facet. There are, every day there are new techniques being invented for explainability, for bias detection, for bias mitigation, for robustness, et cetera. So you sort of have this combinatorial thing that you have to think of trust across all of these facets, and for every facet, there's a lot of techniques that one can use to, to, to bring trust into your pipeline. So our work in that space has been really from IBM research. I think we've had an agenda now in, I, in trust with AI for uh, six, seven years, well before trust in AI became a day-to-day uh, you know, -day discussion. And we've been releasing open source toolkits that both empower developers with algorithms that we have implemented, have been published in the literature, but also, if you will, with guides that assist people in figuring out, for a certain technique, which of these many techniques should I use? What applies where? So that's sort of the space of trustworthy AI that continues to remain critical piece of our agenda. Now, what do foundation models, if you will, add to the agenda? So they add two things. One approach is, as part of fine-tuning, you very rarely are going to deploy the foundation model itself. Most of the time, you're fine-tuning a foundation model for a particular task, deploying that model. So as part of that process, all of the tools that we have developed to test models, verify them, test for bias, you know, build explainability, can be applied as a tool chain as part of fine-tuning a foundation model. So sort of what's one line of work that we are doing. But the more interesting one is, what can you do upfront? Can you create foundation models that inherently learn representations that are quote-unquote trustworthy? What does it even mean? So that's where we, our teams are working on, and you know, we sort of internally like to use the word trust formers, right, to, as, a, as, a, as a take on transformer architectures. How do you bring in trust right into the training of the, of the foundation models? And one of the pieces of work that we are doing is, again, like I said, how do you explore the space? There's a trade-off between if you will, the utility of the representations you learn, their fidelity, their privacy characteristics, their robustness. And so how, as the developer of a foundation model or a creator of foundation model, how can you capture metrics? How can you test foundation models? How can you explore the space? So we're really building like a, a tooling and benchmark because our approach is not that there's going to be an answer. There isn't going to be an answer that says, here you go, here is how you build a trustworthy foundation model. The answer is going to be a tool set, benchmark, and metrics. And then you're going to have, as the user or the creator of the foundation model, use those to create the right model for the use case that, that you need to do. And we know these are not the same. I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, if you will, um, bias and hate speech if I'm training foundation models on time series data. I do have to worry about robustness. I do have to worry about explainability, but some I don't have to worry about. So the considerations are different, but I think that's our approach is to, to really invent a new set of techniques to build these foundation models. I love that term, trust formers for trustworthy foundation models. It gets at the core of what you're doing. And you've talked a little bit about what practitioners need to think about as they explore this space of trade-offs that, that you're evaluating. Um, from the business leader perspective, if I'm at the C-suite and I'm coming to you and, and you have a really interesting approach with foundation models to bring to bear to a problem, what sort of questions do I need to be asking my own organization in order to understand you know, aspects of my data that are going to be important for the fine-tuning step for you or aspects that may lead you to, to think about this problem space in a different way? So I think there's, um, look, a lot of the usual uh, sort of, if you will, advice or, or, or uh, statements that, that we've always used to think about AI continue to apply. There's only one color that I would apply, that I don't think the, the discussion on, if you will, the ROI or should I or should I not about foundation model should be taken on like a per use case basis. Because if, if you take that lens, because the 
act of creating a foundation model is a heavyweight activity, the ROI maps will, ne will never work out. So I think the approach as a business leader is to almost think of what are the data domains? What are the data domains in which I know I want to do a lot of AI? I may actually be trying to do a lot of AI today. I may have an entire dedicated data science team doing customer analytics on customer data. They may be doing analytics on my purchase and procurement, or they may be, look at those data domains. And then I think the discussion is to have is, if I could build a foundation model on this data domain, then how many use cases is it going to support? And what productivity am I going to be able to? I'm going to make essentially a, an entire army of data science teams now way more productive because I'm giving them some a better starting point to work with. So that's so that's sort of one different color as business leaders think about it. The other element I would add is sometimes it's easy to to think of I, I, foundation models aren't like five years away, ten years away, like they are here and now. So the other element of here is yes. There is always an element of you know, risk taking. Am I a leader? Shall I wait for three other people in my industry to try it out? I would, our view is foundation models have already happened in NLP. So there's like no debate there. It's already there. Um, I, won't be, I would be very surprised if by 2025 or so, uh, more than one third of AI in the enterprise isn't powered in some way, shape, or form by foundation models. I'll be very surprised. So, so you're, you're taking a, you know, you're getting new technology, but this is not far out. It's happening here and now in that sense. My last commentary uh, just uh, from that perspective is, I think there is a spectrum of foundation models. So there are these general purpose, large pre-trained models, like, you know, a general purpose language model that you could almost argue, that's the job of AI technology providers to build. I'm just going to use it as a service or as a model. I don't need to build it myself as an enterprise. The second category is going to be sort of more domain specific industry models. They're still pre-trained, but they are not, you're not gonna be able to use a model trained on English like to do chemistry language prediction. Like, you know, so you're gonna to have to build domain specific models, could still be general purpose. And then comes industry, uh, client or enterprise specific foundation models or models trained on, on client data. So that's the other lens of, of each of these data domains do they fall into a domain where I can just get a foundation model from somebody? Do I need to build it myself? Do I have to partner? I think that'll be the other interesting discussion to have with business leaders. I love that sense of urgency. It's useful to remind ourselves that foundation models aren't three years away. They're actually here today and they're, they're already impacting human beings. So uh, it leads me to my next question. You know, as you talk about these data domains and how you consider their differences, one of the core principles behind the research that you're doing at Watson is the idea of human-centered design. And that also informs how you think about inclusivity and, and other issues in AI development. Can you talk about what human-centered design means at IBM Research and the impact that it's already having on how AI transforms our lives? No, so I think it's a, it's a fantastic question. And look, uh, human-centered AI more broadly, and then obviously the design of systems that involve AI uh, is a central piece of our overall strategy. We have like a dedicated theme. Um, and, and the way we think of it as, while we organize some of our other technology work in sort of domains of specialty, the, the NLP team, the team that does time series analytics, the teams that build the platforms, the human-centered AI theme is, if you will, a cross-cutting enabler, because you have to think about it in every one of these contexts. The overarching sort of philosophy behind the work is that human-centered AI essentially recognizes the fact that we're building systems for humans and AI to work together, not, not as a replacement. And much as we say, Automation is one of the elements of it. That is to only take away certain kinds of work so that you humans and AI still have to cooperate to get work done. So that's central to the thinking process. And so the way we, we, we take that work is the human-centered AI team works sort of hand in hand with the teams that do each of the other areas of work that we talked about. And they approach it from the lens of really wear a persona hat. So there are things that we do that are for data science teams. There are things that we create that are for end business personas, where an end product embeds AI, and there the question is, okay, I know what explainability algorithm to use. I have my favorite list of 25, I know this thing works. But how do you surface it? If I'm, I'm doing explainability of a, of a model that was used for anomaly detection, I'm, I'm using it in a dashboard for a process engineer, the way I surface that is different from for that same model, how do I do explainability for the data scientist who is developing the model? 
which is different from for that same model, how do I provide explainability for a business leader who just wants to know what the AI is doing, how much it is delivering value? So these personas are very different. So our human-centered AI team looks very carefully at that intersection between the technology, the persona, and then starts to inform how to think about design. One of the things they are doing is also setting standards and prescription. We have a larger IBM design uh, organization that's sort of across the IBM organization. They work with research teams and product teams. So the human-centered design research team works very closely with IBM design in figuring out how to provide best practices, guidebooks, and so on, on how to bring all of this technology, particularly around trustworthy AI, in the context of specific products that embed AI in them. That's great. You obviously are covering a, a lot of different perspectives and issues in AI and the work that you're doing at IBM. And so uh, with our, our last few questions here, I, I just want to delve into what gets you the most excited. When you think about the next couple of years and the research and the work that you're doing, what really excites you the most in terms of the potential for foundation models? Uh, um, yeah, so I think, look, I think we're, uh, you know, much as I said foundation models are here and now, I know that there's so much to do. Um, what excites me is, I think this approach is addressing a lot of real pain points. Right? I go back to where we began with enterprise AI. The pain points were, sk were skills. The pain points were it takes too much time to curate my data. The pain points were it takes too long to get ROI. So while they are not a panacea for all of those, I think foundation models do provide a way to think about how we might address some of these things and a new way of building AI. So that's exciting. What's obviously even more exciting as a, as a research team and a technologist is what's more is there to invent. So it's very clear that a lot of architectures are going to get invented. The approach of creating reusable representation is here to say, but it's not, it's not that you know, transformer architectures are going to be the only architectures. New architectures are getting invented. Some will be refi refinements. Some will be net new ones. Uh, architectures to deal with, uh, you know, geospatial data with other kinds of data. So there's going to be a lot of, you know, just real innovation, which is always exciting. I think the other element that really excites me is making this efficient. Now, this, I think, you know, we all know, you know, training these large models does, you know, take a lot, take a lot in terms of energy, power, CPU, compute. So we have a big agenda in IBM Research that is around bringing efficiency, power, and resource efficiency into creation of large models. That goes all the way from the stack. This is hardware innovation. New kinds of digital cores, analog cores, new ways to build computer systems to recognize that this is the workload. And, and we really believe that this kind of efficiency is a full stack story. You've got to innovate all the way from the silicon up to distributed systems, middleware, software, algorithms to drive down efficiency. We have an ambition to really like bring down order of magnitude efficiencies into creation of these, of these models. So that's a second vector that's very, very interesting and exciting. And then the last one is, look, these models, I mean, the holy, one of the holy grails, of course, remains bringing in semantics, reasoning into this. So how do you now enhance these representations with uh, with more reasoning capabilities as opposed to statistical or pattern matching capabilities. Because these representations are here to say they are delivering huge value. So it's going to be about then bringing that other element that is missing today. And so I sort of see three vectors. There's obviously the scale vector, there is the efficiency vector, and there's just the richness of the representation vector. And I see exciting research and technology agendas in all three dimensions going forward. That's great. You mentioned reasoning and maybe emergent behaviors that are coming out of foundation models that are now hotly debated in this space. And you also talked about the potential for AI to work hand in hand with humans. It, it's, a, it's a tool to enable humans to do more. Um, what do you see the, the mode of operating between humans and AI um, evolving in the future as these models gain more reasoning capabilities and they could talk a little bit more about the reasoning behind decisions to, to a human being that has to partner with them? So I think, I think there's like a few important elements that if we're going back to our discussion on human-centered design, I think explainability and transparency is critical. So at, at the heart, if you're going to have systems where humans and AI collaborate, um, if the AI cannot explain the decision or the suggestion or the recommendation, there is no way that collaboration is going to, going to happen. So, so to me, the, a central element of this whole thing is going to have to be that piece of explainability. A second element 
and you can call it, if in human beings we would call it honesty, but maybe in AI we like to use the word in trustworthy AI of, it's a very technical term, but I think very critical of uncertainty quantification. How does the model know how much it knows and how much it does not know? Be able to faithfully communicate that. Because then as a collaborator, you know, well, okay, it looks like you have a problem here. I'm going to go do something else with somebody else. We do that all the time as human beings, right? We bring expertise together. But I think today, today that kind of information is available, but it's very technical. So the average, even data scientist, let alone an end user, is going to understand if I expose raw uncertainty quantification numbers from a model. So I think we have a, a ways to go in sort of those two dimensions, sort of the explainability and being able to convey what I know and do not know. Now, you could argue that that's hard enough for small models. When I build big foundation models and derive them, is it going to become harder? Possibly. But I think that's sort of the technical challenge in front of us to make these systems way more transparent to enable that kind of human, human AI collaboration to happen. One other aspect of your answer about what excites you about the future AI is this idea of maybe vertical integration might be a term you can use where you're delving into chip design, you know, data center deployments, um, but, and you are at one of the few organizations in the world that is best suited to handle this full vertical integration. I'm curious for you, how do you empower your team to have those conversations where you're crossing across many different types of disciplines, um, different modes of thinking about operations? How do you have a researcher paired with someone that's also looking at hardware problems and, and is thinking about a new approach there? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's, it's one of those things as sort of, you know, leaders of big organizations, we always try to bring talent of different kinds together and get a common medium. I think what's been very powerful has been uh, sort of anchoring across the stack on workloads. So, and that's one of the benefits, again, that foundation models have provided. They've provided a set of well-defined workloads around which we can bring teams together. So we can ask the question, what does it take to run this workload today? What does it take in terms of time, resources, energy consumption? And then set goals that really are goals across the stack. And then every layer of the stack has to work with each other. To, so you will have the goal of, I want to be able to now train this model. Well, it takes a month today on 700 GPUs. Can I bring this down to a week and, and, and one third the number of GPUs or one third the number of you know, uh, 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 watts of power? Now that's an integrated goal. Now that's going to motivate the algorithm designer to become more efficient, the distributed systems middleware team to think carefully about data movement and shuffling and all of those kinds of things. And it goes all the way into chip design to understand the workload. How am I going to cache the models? How do I do reuse? So I think workloads are a great way to bring teams together. And I think that's the other advantage of having these big workloads that are so central to AI allows you to now to bring the teams together and ask those questions. And again, we definitely at IBM Research have the, uh, and I have investments across the stack. Up in Albany, which is you know, two hours from where I sit, we have a IBM AI hardware center uh, where we do work with a global ecosystem of partners around sort of next generation of semiconductor technology at that level. And then we're able to take that, layer our software, uh, and, and a big portion of our overall strategy, as you know, is a hybrid perspective. To have these kinds of platforms run on-prem, on other clouds, our cloud, and over time on you know, distributed infrastructure. So that's where the middleware people come in. I need to solve these problems without necessarily making assumptions of exactly where this thing will run and make these AI workloads work in a hybrid environment. And then goes all the way to the, to the teams that are innovating the new generation of AI architectures. Great. That sounds like an amazing area to explore. So I, I, I'm super grateful to have someone with your background and perspective here to, to talk about these issues. But with that, Suram, this, this has been a great conversation. I, I, I'm, I feel very fortunate to have spent this time with you. You bring up uh, uh, unquantifiable certainty um, as something that you delve into. I will say with high certainty, probably our audience has found new perspectives, new insights from this conversation. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you, Vijay. It's been a great conversation. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to chat with you.